Well, good morning, everybody. I am so glad to see you. God bless you. I hope you've had a good week thus far. Somebody tell me something good that's happened to you this week. I'm here. Yeah. I'm alive. I woke up this morning on this side of the grass. That's a good one. Yeah. What? What now? Miss Deb is behaving herself this week. Look out now. I don't know it. I don't know about that. What, what do you say, Deb? No. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. We're going to sing some good hymns and gospel songs. If you'll take the hymnal that's in the pew rack in front of you and turn to one of my very favorites, it's number 333. And it says, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. I tell you what, I'm just going to let you stay seated this morning. Yeah, oh, everybody goes, oh, bless you. <laughs> we'll sing all three stanzas of number 333, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all the alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all the good that we can trust the Lord? He is trustworthy. If you'll turn to the front of your hymnal, toward the front, number four, a great Fanny Crosby hymn, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. Now, a lot of times we'll skip over the middle verse of a hymn, but we're not going to do that today because if you'll remember, last week, we talked about the redemption that Jesus bought for us in our passage in Ephesians chapter 1. And then look at what it says there in verse 2 of this great hymn, To God Be the Glory. It says, Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. So we can't let that slip by. We've got to sing all three stanzas here this morning of uh, number 4, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Let it ring. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through 
Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender. Truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done, great things he had taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory, when Jesus we see. Yes, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Son and give him the glory, great things he had done. Oh, can you say amen to that? Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, this next one, I know, I guess I could say this about every one of them. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, I, I feel so blessed to have grown up in, in a church that. Uh, sang hymns and gospel songs and sang newer songs as well. And so uh, some young people, people younger than me, <laughs> don't have that heritage. And uh, boy, I'm so glad that what we do here at Auburn is we do a little bit of everything, you know, because these songs, like the one that we're about to sing, number 210, they mean so much to us, and they're ways that, uh, that speak to our heart. And these are songs that have stood the test of time. Number two, Tim, is, is My Jesus, I Love Thee. And what a, a poem, really, to the Lord, a, a prayer to the Lord. We're going to sing the first verse only here of number 210. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Last time you told the Lord that you loved Him, we just sang it uh, today. Amen. Good. Well, let's pause and and tell Him in prayer before we sing our our next hymn. Okay. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we love you because you loved us first. You are the one who is everything to us, Lord. You are so good. Father, you fill our lives with such joy. And Lord, when we think about who we are, 
There's no way we deserve that. But you, <laughs> the hymn says, you looked beyond my fault and saw my need. And you paid the debt that I could not pay. You paid it at the cross with your own blood. As we sang, Lord, you bought us, you redeemed us. Thank you, Jesus. Our heart's desire today is we want to draw near to you. And Lord, thank you for your promise and your word. You, you tell us if we will draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So God, we're waiting on the edge of our seat, expectant today to hear what you're going to say to us. Oh Lord, change us from the inside out. Help us to be obedient to you and believe what you say. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing one more. Uh, again, another favorite. This is number 247. I want us to think about this hymn before we sing it here together. It's called Come Thou Almighty King. I'm sure this is one that you've sung uh, many times in your life, but uh, have you thought about the fact that this is a Trinitarian hymn? What I mean by that is it speaks to the members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look at the, the stanzas with me now. The first is addressed to, uh, to the King, to the Lord, the Father. It says, Come Thou Almighty King. And then look at the second stanza. It's addressed, Come Thou Incarnate Word. Now, that's a, that's a theological way of saying Jesus. That's who the Incarnate Word is. The third stanza says, Come Holy Comforter. And we know that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then look at verse 4. To the great one in three, the highest praises be. So let's sing all four stanzas here of Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King, help us Thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. In this glad hour, thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, spirit of power. To the great one in three, the highest praises be, hence evermore, thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love. singing this morning. Very good. Very good. Well, if you'll take out your Saints Alive guide, I just want to go over a couple of announcements with you here. First of all, um, we sure have appreciated those folks that have done special music for us, messages in song, and we're excited about, uh, about what God's got in the future lined up for us. You can see on the back of your Saints Alive guide, Dennis Nolan will be with us next uh, Wednesday. He's a member at Priceful Baptist Church and helps out with their worship ministry there. Very talented, uh, very talented fellow. I hope he's going to bring his guitar with him because he can tear it up if you've ever heard him. Um, 
uh, tomorrow we have our associational senior adult gathering at Bissell Baptist Church. We're gonna, the event starts at 10 and goes to noon and it will be followed by a lunch there at the church. Now we are going to meet here at the church to take our bus at 915. If you want to ride the bus, we'll be here at 915. And I do know I've got the sign up list here. here here's what we're going to do. Okay, I've called in our order and all that kind of stuff, but I'm just predicting that they've got a little extra set aside. Okay, and so if you have not had a chance to sign up, if you'll do me a favor, you'll notice on this second page right here, I've got a line right here. And what I'm going to do today is I'll call in our uh, the folks if we have any additions. Okay, I'll call it into the associational office today and we're going to be just fine, all right? We would love to have you go. Don't, don't anybody think, well, I didn't sign up. I can't go. No, come on. It's going to be fine, okay? And the more the merrier, all right? Now, that is on uh, tomorrow, okay? And then you can see the other announcement about the, uh, the Precious Memories event. I've told you about that before. You can, you can read the details there, so we won't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but I sure am looking forward to that. And Sheila has been working on our, uh, our catered lunch uh, this week, getting things lined up, and uh, she's just a treasure. Now, when you see Sheila Kelts, uh, just hug her neck, because she's worth every, everything uh, that our church uh, invests in her. Well, speaking of treasures, we have a treasure with us today, Miss Billy McFerrin. How many of you appreciate Billy and what she does? Yes. Before our Bible study time, I, I asked Billy to just bless us with an instrumental, and so she's going to take us to the throne room here uh, with the music that she's going to share. Billy, bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I tell you, it is a privilege to work with folks like Billy and Teresa and Jason and Tucker and Walt and Terry and Lee and Luke and all of the instrumentals that we have here. Uh, you know, I, can I just say, tell you before we get started, I feel like the, the artist, the painter that has the... Uh, uh, I don't even know what you call it, the palette, thank you, has the palette, and they have all the different colors on the palette. That's, that's how blessed we are here at Auburn. 
with all the talent and ability that God has blessed this church in the worship ministry. We just, uh, this, this person and this person, they add this part. Man, it makes my job so nice. Why would anybody want to be anywhere else than Auburn Baptist Church? I tell you. Well, as we get... Yeah. <laughs> as we get... <laughs> As we get started today, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and here's a specific prayer for us, okay? The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's the one who teaches, and so we want to get in tune with him and ask him just to speak to our hearts, okay? So let's do that now. Oh, oh Lord, you are so good, and I just thank you for my brothers and sisters and the joy it is to be part of a church family and Lord, we know you, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. And so, Lord, we just want to sit at your feet. Lord, we want you to teach us. Not so that we can fill our heads with knowledge, although knowing about you, I mean, what, what could be better than knowing you, knowing about you? But Lord, we don't want to just know about you. We want to know you in relationship. We want to know you better. We want to know who you are and what you're like and we know, Lord, that if we, if we get that, if you do that for us, then we will be changed because you are so glorious and so great that if, you can, if we can see you with our spiritual eyes, if we can see you with the eyes of our heart, we are transformed. And so we ask you to do that today by your spirit, through your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's a question for you. Anybody recognize the following names? Hercule Poirot or Jane Marple? Anybody recognize either one of those names? Well, those are recurring characters in the mystery novels of the acclaimed British mystery writer of the previous century, Agatha Christie. Anybody heard that name before? All right. If you've ever read an Agatha Christie novel or seen a movie or a television show based on one, her, uh, one of her novels, chances are those two, one of those two characters is going to be in a Hercule Poirot. You have to, that's, that's my best Belgian accent, okay? Hercule Poirot. Uh, it sounds like you're almost, you're hawking something up. <laughs> yeah, it's like Hebrew, I guess. Or Jane Marple, uh, one of those might be in it. Now, here's a question for you. For those of you, how many of you like a good mystery story? Anybody like to read one? Yeah. So, for those of you who like a good mystery, are you the kind that can resist the temptation to read and skip to the end? Yeah, anybody have to skip to the end? Yeah, i got to find out who done it. I get so wrapped up in it, yeah. Well, today we're going to study a passage that teaches us about a great mystery that God has revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So, uh, as you know, we are working our way through uh, the book of Ephesians, and the passage that we've been taking our time, working slowly through uh, so far, is Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. So if you've got your Bible, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 3, and we'll go through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, 
when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, you know that over the last several weeks, we've been walking slowly through this passage, verses 3 through 14, and we've, we've seen that the Holy Spirit gives us in this passage a list of th some of the wondrous blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. This treasure, and we said it's almost like this passage is a huge diamond with all of its facets, and what we're going to do each week is we just turn it just a little bit, and the light shines on a different facet of blessing that we have in Jesus. God has given us these glorious things. We, we've said this week after week because we want to underscore this point. God's given us this glorious blessing through our union with Jesus. Remember we talked about how we've been placed in Christ, and that's how these blessings come to us. Now, last week, we learned about the redemption that Jesus purchased for us with his own blood, the forgiveness of our sins. We learned about how Jesus bought us out of slavery to the law, our slavery to sin, he bought us out of slavery to Satan and slavery to the world system. Jesus purchased us and set us free. Now this week, it's going to feel like we have shifted into turbo. Because are you ready for this? We're going to cover three verses. <laughs> what? <laughs> Lord willing, we're going to cover three verses today. So here, here are the verses that we really want to uh, spend some time with. We're going to begin at the end of verse 7. You might call it the, the C part of verse 7 and go through 10. It says, According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now today, I would like us to think deeply about three aspects of this passage, okay? First, we're going to talk about lavish grace, lavish grace. Second, we're going to talk about the mystery of God's will. And then third, we're going to talk about the master plan. We see all those three things in this passage, lavish grace, the mystery of God's will, and the master plan. Let's begin thinking about lavish grace. I want to point out to you two words in verses 7 and 8 that tell us something about the character of God and the way he deals with his children. First, in verse 7, the word riches. The riches of his grace, that's the phrase. These, it's talking about these blessings that we have received in Christ, namely our redemption through Jesus' blood and the forgiveness of our sins that Jesus purchased for us with his blood. It says these are according to the riches of his grace. And then the second word there is the word lavished. We find that in verse 8. God lavished the riches of his grace on us. If you have the King James Version, yours is going to say, wherein he hath abounded toward us. The New King James says, which he hath made to abound toward us. The Christian Standard Version says, that which he richly poured out to us. Now, that word, lavished, or abounded, or richly poured out, that, that English word or phrase there comes from a Greek word, perusio, perusio, and it means to lavish or to make to abound. Now, there's a scholar that I read a lot. His name is uh, Woost, last name is Woost, and he quotes another scholar named Thayer who gives this definition of, the, of this word, this Greek word. It means to exceed a fixed number or measure, to be over and above a certain number or measure, to exist and to be at hand. Are you ready for this? Here's a word, in abundance. We're talking about a lot. Okay, Woost goes on to expand this definition. He says, the verb means to exist in super, superfluity. <laughs> That's quite a word for a redneck from Alabama. It means to super, uh, to super abound. It means an oversized 
grace. It's more than enough to save and keep saved for time and eternity, every sinner who comes to God in Jesus Christ. Now, let's put this in redneck terms where I can understand it. Okay. Have you ever gone to the, uh, through the drive-thru at McDonald's and said, I want you to supersize my order? You ever done that before? What does that mean? It means that they're going to come out with a bucket full of fries. Okay, they might dump them in your lap. This is, I mean, it's like a garbage pail full of fries, all right? And it's like a, it's, it's so much Coca-Cola in that, in that meal that you got that you have to drink it out of a PVC pipe. I mean, it is, it is a lot, okay? That's what it means to be supersized, right? Um, okay, uh, if, if you don't like McDonald's, how about, um, how about Sonic? You pull up to the Sonic drive through and you say, I want the Route 44 Cherry Limeade. Okay. It comes out, I mean, it takes two people to bring this thing out to your car, right? It is supersized. That's the word that we're talking about here. That's the word picture. It is so much. It's an abundance. It's more than you expect. It's so much. It's amazing. Now, what's the point that Paul is making here? Here it is. God is generous in giving grace to us. He's not stingy with his grace that he gives to us in Jesus Christ. He's not a miser with his mercy, doling out just enough but not too much. No, 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 that's not him. He is generous. He lavishes grace upon us. He is open. He is warm. He is giving. Do you remember the Charles Dickens novel, A Christmas Carol? After Ebenezer Scrooge, now Scrooge was the miser to end all misers, right? Okay. After, though, that, that Christmas Eve when the, the spirits appeared to him, you, you remember this story, he has a change of heart. He is, he's got his heart changed, and he, he wakes up Christmas morning with an undeniable urge to give and to give generously. Remember how he goes to the toy shop. One of my favorite depiction of this is in the musical Scrooge from 1970. that stars Albert Finney. I don't know if you've seen this before, but um, Scrooge goes to the toy shop, and in and instead of trying to collect on the toy shop owner's debt, which is why the guy thinks he's there on Christmas morning, he surprises the guy by piling up toy after toy after toy after toy to give to Bob Cratchit's children. The, the astounded shopkeeper can't even believe his eyes and ears when Scrooge tells him in an excited voice that he wants a doll and a hobby horse, and some flutes, and some trumpets, and some bows and arrows, and a cricket bat, and drum, and these boats. And, and by this time, it's comical, because the toy shop owner is falling, falling around behind him, and Scrooge is piling up, and we need one of these, and we need one of this, and some of this. And so finally, the guy looks at him and goes, Mr. Scrooge, what has happened? <laughs> Totally unexpected. It's so much. There's an overabundance. And when they arrive at Bob Cratchit's house, the family can't believe that this stingy miser is lavishing all these gifts, all of these riches on them. They're flabbergasted. They're amazed. They're dumbfounded. Now, brothers and sisters, some of us have a view of God that is erroneous. Some of us deep down, we would never say this out loud because this is a very unbaptistic thing to say. This is not something you say out loud in church, come on. But deep down in our heart of hearts, some of us believe that God is like Ebenezer Scrooge, that he's a miser, that he only, he, he might give us just, just an, uh, and then send, send us off. No. No, what Paul is telling us here is that our God is gracious in overabundance. He's a warm, generous giver. Gracious, remember, graciousness, remember, is the character of God. Warmth, loving, kind, welcoming, giving. That's who he is. Lavish grace. 
Second, we see in this passage the mystery of God's will. Now, notice in the the highlighted portion of the text there, it says that uh, God has been making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Commentator H.W. Honer defines the word mystery here in verse 9 as a previously hidden truth unveiled by God's revelation. I'm going to give you time to write that down if you're taking notes. The word mystery here in verse 9, what it means is a previously hidden truth unveiled by God's revelation. How many of you know that we don't know anything of spiritual significance unless it is revealed to us by God? I don't know the Lord at all unless he reveals himself to me. I don't know anything about the Lord unless he reveals it to me. Anything I know has been because he has graciously shown himself and shown his ways to me. That's how this works. Now, This leads us to explore a concept that we see in Scripture, and it's this idea of progressive revelation. Now, there's a theological term. You can impress all of of your friends at lunch today. You just see if you can work this into conversation. Progressive revelation, okay? What it means is the idea that God reveals more and more of his great gospel plan as the timeline of Scripture goes along. He reveals more and more of his great gospel plan as the time of Scripture goes along. Now, we see at the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we see only hints and shadows in the beginning of what God is going to accomplish through Jesus. And as the timeline of Scripture marches on, we see more and more and more of God's plan coming to light. God planned it that way on purpose. It's progressively revealed. He reveals it to us over time. Now, what was this mystery that God revealed over time? What was the mystery of his will that he would accomplish in Christ? Well, here it is. The mystery is the gospel. And here's the gospel. God preparing a people for his son, Jesus. That's the story of the gospel in a nutshell. God preparing a people for his son, Jesus. And the people of God, of course, are us, the church, people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's think about this. God created man in his own image, and then we chose to rebel. We chose to sin. The problem was our sin. How could a just God solve the problem of our sin? He couldn't just excuse it or sweep it under the rug. That's not justice, and that's not who God is. Yet, God loves us and did not want us to receive the just punishment that we deserve for our sin. How would God solve this dilemma? This is, if all you had in the Bible was Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, and it was the end of chapter 3, and and that's where the Bible ended, that is a conundrum. How is God going to solve this, this problem of our sin? What is God going to do? Well, praise the Lord, he didn't end it in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. Because over time, what we see is that God solves our sin problem through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Messiah who would take on flesh in his incarnation, become our representative, completely fill the law perfectly, and take our sins upon himself at the cross as the spotless lamb of God, whom the, wor- whom the Lord would raise from the dead as a sign to the whole universe that the Father had accepted the per- perfect sacrifice of the Son on our behalf. But we don't see all of that clearly at the beginning, do we? No, we see hints and shadows. So let's, let's just think through this, this timeline of the gospel that we see revealed in Scripture. Let's think about Genesis 3. We mentioned this earlier. When, when Satan's doom is declared by the Lord, he says that Satan would strike, would strike the heel of the offspring of Adam, and that was fulfilled at the cross. He's, Jesus is the offspring of Adam, 
and Satan struck his heel at the cross, okay? And the offspring of Adam, God says in Genesis 3, would crush Satan's head. And that was fulfilled at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Oh, why do you think we sing? Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. Yeah, Jesus won that day. He, he crushed the head of Satan. It was completely fulfilled at the resurrection. And it will be ultimately fulfilled when Jesus returns to reign eternally, casting Satan down and his minions into the fiery pit forever. And that's Genesis 3. Genesis 12. God calls a man named Abram, a pagan, by the way, who worshipped, are you ready for this? Abram worshipped a moon god called, you can't make this up, the moon god was called Sin. <laughs> that was the name of the god, Sin. Yeah, he, Abram was a pagan, but God called him out of his pagan belief and he was a man through whom God would miraculously provide, provide the child of promise, Isaac, and eventually a great nation, and ultimately through whom would come the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then scripture moves on to the Exodus. God frees his people, Israel, from bondage in Egypt, pointing ahead to the ultimate freedom that will come through the Messiah, Jesus. And then the scripture moves into Joshua and the conquest of Canaan. God delivers his people in, out of, uh, into the land of Canaan, pointing ahead to the abundant life of blessing and spiritual battle and victory that Jesus brings. And then we see First and Second Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. And in there we see King David and the other kings of Israel pointing ahead to the perfect king, the Lord Jesus. And then we see the Psalms and the other wisdom literature, and those are the songs of Israel, and they're all ultimately about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Scripture moves on to Isaiah and the other prophets. And in those books, we see more and more in those prophecies about the Messiah, that he would be the suffering servant who would take the sins of the people on himself. We, we single out Isaiah here because that book has so much about the Messiah in it. And then after the years of silence between the, the Testaments, then John the Baptist comes, and he prepares the way, preaching a gospel of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and pointing, literally pointing to Jesus as the Messiah, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And then we have, of course, the four gospels revealing who Jesus is and what he does. And after that, the book of Acts, the gospel uh, it goes forth through the church in the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is made up of believers in Christ who have Jewish backgrounds and believers in Christ who have Gentile backgrounds, and God brings them together into this church, becoming one in Christ, and that initial, and that initial breach is healed. And then we move on to the New Testament letters. They show us not only how we're to live, but who we are in Christ and how we can have confidence for the end of history that God's got it all under control. And then finally, it leads up to the book of Revelation. And in the words of the, the, the great gospel song, the king is coming. That is the timeline of the gospel that we see throughout scripture. It's one story. It's one story. And it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, nobody told me that. Nobody explained that to me. For me, or if they did, let me put it this way. If they did, I didn't get it. That's probably more accurate. Somebody might have said it, but I didn't get it. For me, the Bible growing up was just a, a group of stories that were not connected in any way. I didn't understand anything of, of There was no thread, there was no through line through all of Scripture. But I want to tell you here today, what we've just gone over, the gospel is on every page. It all points to the Lord Jesus. Every page reflects Jesus Christ. And over time, through this progressive revelation, God revealed more and more about Jesus in the salvation that Jesus provides as the timeline of, of the gospel and Scripture went along. So we think, we think thirdly about, in this passage, about the master plan. 
And you'll notice I changed it just a little bit here because I like this. The master plan is the master's plan because it's all about Jesus. The master plan is the master's plan because it's all about Jesus. Back to our passage here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 says, Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth, here's the highlighted text, in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, in this last section, I want you to notice two things. First, the person in the plan. We've already pointed it out. In Christ, in verse 9. In Him, in verse 10. The person in the plan, it's all about Jesus. Everything points to Christ. Just as we said when we first started our study, that our personal salvation is wrapped up in Jesus, cannot be separated from Jesus. Just as that is true, so too the end to which this world is moving is wrapped up in Jesus. It's all about Him. All of history is moving in a direction under God's direction. The Lord is moving, if you will, the big tectonic plates of history toward an end. He's moving them toward the recognition of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Some people will say, they'll shake their head and say, hmm, what's this world coming to? You ever heard somebody say, maybe you've said that. Maybe you might have said that this morning. I turn on the news. What's this world coming to? Uh, you've heard this before. This is an old preacher saying, so this is not going to be new, but I want to remind it of you. What's this world coming to? This world's coming to an end. And the end to which it is coming is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is moving to Jesus. Jesus is the culmination of everything. Everything that God has done throughout of all of history. And there is going to be a day that we're going to see right here in the next part. It says the purpose in the plan. There's going to be a day when God unites all things in Jesus. He's going to unite all things in Jesus. The entire universe is going to recognize the truth about Jesus Christ and be brought under his lordship perfectly and finally. Now, we only have just a few minutes left, and in the, in the couple minutes that we have left, I want to point you to three passages of Scripture very briefly because they illustrate what I just said, that the entire universe is going to recognize the Lordship of Jesus. First, if you've got your Bible, flip over with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Colossians chapter 1 has a beautiful description of the Lord Jesus and his supremacy and his preeminence. In verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1, it says, He, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, through Jesus, and for him, for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. King Jesus is going to reign in ultimate authority and dominion over everything and everyone. And this is good news. This is the best news because Jesus is such a good king. He's the perfect king. Now, that's the first scripture. The second scripture I want you to turn to is in Philippians chapter 2. This will be a very familiar passage to you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Some of you probably memorized this in Bible drill growing up. Growing up. I'm, I'm probably not going to read it in the version that you might have memorized, but let's, let's read it together. I'll read it aloud while you read it silently. Philippians 
2, 5 through 11, Paul writes, Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, here it is. Are you ready? I love this. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody, everyone, is going to bow before Jesus' lordship and submit to his authority, all to the glory of God the Father. He wins. We talked about at the very beginning of the lesson, skipping to the back of the book and reading the end of the mystery. Listen, it's no mystery. Jesus wins. He wins. One more passage of scripture here. Revelation eleven fifteen. It says, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Yeah. King Jesus is going to right every wrong. Every evildoer will answer to Jesus for their wrongs, for their sin, and for the pain that they've caused others. Now you say, Troy, where's the application? Here it is. Sometimes we look, sometimes we look at this world and we get discouraged because it seems like people get away with it. Human justice is the best we have, but let's face it, it's faulty. It's not ultimate justice. It's flawed. But there is coming a day, there is coming a day when Jesus, King Jesus, will set everything right. Everyone will be held accountable to to him. We look at pain and suffering in this world, and I am so thankful that our God is just, and he's going to set it right. He's going to make it right. I look, I look at people who commit crimes against others. And they, they might seem to get away with it. Sometimes even in our own relationships, some of you have been deeply, deeply hurt. Some of you in unspeakable ways. Maybe you have, maybe you have a, scars that you've carried for a long time, maybe some that you've never even told anybody about, and you wonder, is, is, where's the justice in this? Brothers and sisters, know this. God is going to make it right one day. Jesus reigns, and he's going to reign ultimately. Now, that's the master plan. Praise God for the master plan of the gospel. Let's close in a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you that you reign. You are the king. Even though we don't see as of yet all things under your feet, we know that, Lord, one day that is going to be the case. And you will be glorious, Lord, and everybody will have to bow a knee and confess with their tongue that you are Lord. And so, Lord, we just want to get into practice right now. We just want to say, Jesus is Lord. You reign. And we are so thankful for you, Lord. Thank you that you are in control. You are sovereign God on your throne. And thank you for the redemption that you have given us in Christ. Thank you for lavishing us with grace. Thank you that you're not a miser. Thank you, Jesus, that you are gloriously generous that you pour it out on us. We love you, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I tell you what, if you can't get fired up about this. mm. (coughs) 
We want to say goodbye to everybody who's been worshiping with us online this morning. It's good to have you with us, and we'll see you next Wednesday, okay? God bless you.